Good morning. Today we are on um, Genesis 35 and 36. Uh, so let's pray. Lord Jesus, we just thank you and praise you that your mercy is new every morning. We pray, Lord Jesus, that you would just be with us like you were with Jacob in the good, the bad, the mess ups, and the victories. Lord Jesus, we just pray that you would fill us with your Holy Spirit, that you would give us the mind of Christ, that you would arm us with the breastplate of righteousness, the belt of truth, the boots of peace. May we pick up our shields so we won't fall for that um, attacks of that sneaky snake. And we, may we daily pick up the sh um, sword of the, um, the Spirit, which is the Word of God. I just pray that you would speak through me today, that everything I say would be of you. I pray that you would bind my mouth from speaking anything that are my own thoughts, that you would fill me with the Holy Spirit, that you would cover me by the blood of the Lamb, and that you would share with us um, what you want us to learn from your Word in these two chapters. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. So, 35 opens with um, Jacob is in, his family is in shambles, they're in a mess, because um, he dwelt in Shechem. He got too close to where there was carnality, and his daughter um, Dinah became a victim there, um, and, her, her, um, and the sons are now, um, you know, with this conflict with the dad, um, because in their eyes the dad didn't do anything to protect the daughter or to vindicate her. Um, and they, so they took it upon their own hands um, to have justice, but um, they became, you know, um, basically uh, murderers, um, and they killed all the men in a, in a town. And so his life's in shambles. And so then at this point, instead of God saying, all right, I'm done with you, you just, you messed up, you know, how many chances do I got to give you? Um, God doesn't do that. I mean, God um, knows that um, Jacob has been saved. He's got um, he's got fellowship with him, and so God doesn't give up on us when um, we mess up, which is a total um, praise praise Jesus for His grace. Um, and so God says to Jacob at this point, arise. He doesn't say stay down. Um, I'm going to kick you when you're down. He says arise, arise, Jacob, arise. And that's what He tells us. If you messed up, if you're in the pit, arise. Um, go to Bethel. Now what's Bethel? The house of God. He said, "Arise, Jacob. Go to the go to the house of God, and dwell there. That means make your home there. Dwell there. Stay there. Um, stay in the house of God, and make an altar there to God, who appeared to you when you fled from the face of Esau, your brother." So he's telling him, "You know what? Pick yourself up. Go back to the house of God. I want you to dwell in the house of God, and I want you to make an altar there and worship me." Because I'm the one that appeared to you when you fled from your brother Esau. I'm the one that's been there for you. Um, because remember, at Bethel is where he first encountered God. Um, and he saw Jesus in the ladder. Remember the, um, the angels coming up and down? And, um, and that represented um, Jesus being the only way to the, um, God the Father. And then he sees, um, that's where he had the wrestling with Jesus himself. And he wrestled with Jesus. And Jesus changes his name from Jacob to um, Israel. Um, and Jesus blessed him. And so Bethel is where he's encountered um, God personally and Jesus personally. Um, and so he says, go back there. And said, said, and Jacob said to his household um, and to all who were with him, put away all of your foreign gods that are among you. Purify yourselves and change your garments. Then let us arise and go to Bethel, and I will make an altar there to God, who answered me in the day of my distress, and who has been with me um, been with me in the way which I have gone. So he's saying, God answered me in my distress, in my pit, in my moment of um, failure and, um, and, and loss and mess ups. God answered me in my distress. Um, and he's been with me where I've gone. So he's been with me through the whole thing, the ups, the downs, the valleys, the mountaintops. God's been with me and he acknowledged us and, and wants to worship him. Um, and so they gave Jacob all of their foreign gods which were in their hands and the earrings which were in their ears. And Jacob um, hid them under the um, terebirth tree which was by Shechem. And so what this represents is that when we um, have a true conversion and we truly realize um, I was lost and now I'm found, I was a wretch and now I've been saved. When we have that moment of realizing, man, God has been with me through it all. It's in that appreciation for his grace and his goodness that we then say, I want to get rid of everything that's holding me back. I want to get rid of all the idols in my life. Everything that I'm prioritizing instead of God, I want to get rid of it. And I want to put it at the tree. I want to bury it at the tree. Now, the tree here represents the cross. you know. And when we find that moment of like, 
I was blind and now I see. We want to take all the junk in our life and, and bury it and set it at the foot of the cross. And this tree represents him doing that. And all of the people that are in his um, family and community, they all take their stuff, their junk, and they bury it at the tree um, at, at Calvary. Um, and so that's what he re that represents there. Um, so that's what I said. Okay. And so it says, leave your stuff at the cross. Um, because in grace, we respond to God's goodness. Um, and in his gratitude that the Lord has been with him, um, it, it causes him to want to put away all of his idols in his life. And so John Carson was saying, the power of the cross is not just the removal of the penalty of sin. Yeah, Jesus dying on the cross took away our penalty, our judgment for sin, but it also did, um, it crucified our old man. If you look in Romans chapter 6, it says, that by the power of the cross, it crucified our old sin nature, our old man. So that our old man, our old sinful nature, has no power over us. We, we make choices that we shouldn't make, but really when Jesus died on the cross, the power of our old flesh was put to death. And that's why I said our old flesh, our old man has been crucified but on the cross. Um, so the old man of sin is dead. Um, and what that word dead means is it means rendered inactive. It's been paralyzed. So our sin nature is inactive and paralyzed. We choose to make sin choices, but we should, um, by the power of the cross and in faith, um, we could have, we have power by the power of the Holy Spirit over our sin nature. Um, we don't have to give in to sin. We do, but we don't have to because Jesus already paid that price. Um, it says, because of what Jesus accomplished on the cross, sin has no power over us. So we have to, in faith, say, um, I declare myself free of negative attitude. I'm not going to give in to my negative attitude. Because Jesus died on the cross for that negative attitude. He's given me the power over my negative attitude. And in the power of the Holy Spirit, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to let myself, um, um, get, you know, succumb to that. I'm going to um, declare myself free of addic addictive, whatever I'm addicted to. Because um, Jesus died on the cross for my sins and by the power of the Holy Spirit. And in faith, I don't need to give in to that. My old, old nature is dead. Um, if people are addicted to pornography, if they're addicted to drugs, if they're addicted to whatever it is they're addicted to, the power of the cross um, shed and the blood shed for us gives us victory over that addiction. We just have to, in faith, say, I'm not going to give in to my sin nature anymore because my sin nature has died and been crucified. Same thing with gossip. Whatever our sin is, Jesus died for that on the cross. Um, and so anyway, that's pretty cool. And so it says, um, and they journeyed. Um, and they and and they journeyed, and the terror of God was upon the cities that were all around them, and they did not pursue them. Um, they did not pursue the sons of Jacob. So remember, at the very end of chapter 34, Jacob was like, "What have you guys done? They're gonna come. They're gonna all gather together. All the towns around us are gonna gather together, and they're gonna kill you because of what you've done, um, and all, that you killed all these men of this town." Um, but it says here that the terror of God was upon the cities that were all around them, and they did not pursue um, the sons of Jacob. So God caused this terror to fall upon the, the surrounding nations. And I, I, I thought to myself, this is what we want to pray for our president and for the people and the, the um, assembly members and senators of California, that the terror of God will fall upon them. And so they did not pursue the righteous. For, um, righteousness of uh, or the, those that God's anointed. So Lord Jesus, right now we just pray for our president. We pray, Lord Jesus, that you would cause a terror to fall on those who are accusing him falsely and coming against men in this whole impeachment thing. I pray, Lord Jesus, right now in Jesus' name that the terror of God would fall upon them right now in their beds, in their um, wherever they're at, Lord Jesus, that the terror of God would fall upon them and that they would not pursue our president in this impeachment. We pray, Lord Jesus, that you would give um, victory um, and protection, just like you protected Jacob and his sons from the evil. I pray that you would protect our president um, and our vice president from this evil attack. And I pray right now, Lord, just that the terror of God would fall upon them. And also for the senator that voted um, against SB 673, I pray, Lord, just that the terror of God would fall upon them. And all the people that um, from Planned Parenthood and from all those places that um, um, came up against the bill, um, even um, the... Uh, 
PTF came against them, all the organizations like this that came against that bill and, um, and against our children. I pray that the terror of God would fall upon them um, and that they would not go after our children in California. I pray this in Jesus' name. Um, okay, so now it says, um, so now it says, so Jacob came to, the, to Lux, um, which is in um, Bethel, which is the land of Canaan, he and all the people who were with him, and he built an altar there and called the place El Bethel, because there God appeared to him um, where he fled from his face of um, his brother. Um, okay, now here he changed the name from Bethel, which means house of God, to El Bethel, which means the God of the house of God. And so what um, um, the pastor was saying is this actually shows spiritual maturity because he's realized that the place where he experienced God, um, it's not about the place. So he was, before he was like, this is Bethel. This is where God's um, um, presence is. This is the house of God. But now his, his spiritual maturity has moved. No, it's not about the place. It's not about Bethel. It's about the God of Bethel. That means his relationship has now matured to, it's a personal relationship between me and the God of Bethel. It's not about just going to Bethel, um, which is a house of God. Like It's not about going to just going to church. Um, it's about going to the God of your church, the God over our church, you know? So we don't wor worship, it's not enough to just go into a church. You've gotta go there to worship the God of the church. Does that make sense? Um, it's not about reading just your Bible. It's about worshiping and realizing it's the God of the Bible who wrote the Bible, who inspired the Bible. Um, and so this is where Jacob has now matured. So he's playing, no, this place is um, El Bethel. It's a, it's the, I'm worshiping and I'm building an altar to the God of the house of Bethel. Um, and so it's a showing that he's now moved from, from just um, his spiritual level being in relationship with God being more of a physical thing to now of a personal um, relationship. He's matured. Um, all right, and then it goes on to say that his nanny died because it says, um, now Deborah, Rebecca's nurse, died, and she was buried before Bethel under the tree. So the name of it was called um, Alone Bekoth. And so this was his actual probably nanny because it was Rebecca, his mom's nurse. So his, his nanny died, and he's, he's brokenhearted. Uh, because I think it's called a place of weeping. Um, I forgot what it's called. But anyways, I, I think this, uh, the, the place where he buried her was called like the place of weeping. Um, and so then it says, God appeared to Jacob again when he came um, from Padan Aram and blessed him. And God said to him, so God appeared to Jacob again. He's having this personal encounter with, uh, with God again. And it says, your name is Jacob. So he's reiterating, you're no longer, um, you're, uh, it says, your name is Jacob. Your name shall not be called Jacob anymore, but Israel shall be your name. So, so he called the name Israel. Um, so he called his name Israel. And God said to him, I am God Almighty. Um, be fruitful and multiply. A nation and a company of nations shall proceed from you. And um, kings shall come from your body. The land which I gave Abraham and Isaac, I give to you and your descendants after you. I give you this land. Then God went up from him in the place where he talked to him. Um, so God's appearing to him again. And he's, he's saying, this is who you are. You're no longer Jacob, the trickster. You're Israel um, governed by God. And this is your destiny. This is what your calling is. I'm going to make you a great nation. I'm going to make your descendants great. Um, and so he's reminding him again of his calling and his new, I'm a new creation. So he's, he's saying, you're a new creation. Your name is Israel. Okay. Um, and so, but then um, it says, let me see. Um, so he's telling him, go back to Bethel. Go back to Bethel. Um, go to the house of God and dwell there. And then said, um, so Jacob um, set up a pillar in the place where he talked to him, a pillar of stone, and he poured a drink offering on it, and he poured oil on it. Um, so this represents the drink offering is that he poured wine on um, the pile of stone, the altar, which wine represents the blood of Jesus. So he, 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 he on this altar, he's, he's symbolically pouring out the blood of Jesus, and he's pouring out oil, which represents the Holy Spirit. And so 
John Carson was saying that this is a powerful combination when we worship. It's the, um, we're thankful for the um, blood of Jesus that washes away our old nature and our sin, and we're thankful for the Holy Spirit that equips us and empowers us to go into the destiny that Jesus is calling for us. So this is, a, this is representing Jacob now saying, thank you for um, um, your blood that's washed away Jacob in my old carnal nation, my old, um, the old man, and thank you for your Holy Spirit that's going to empower me to go into this um, future and this calling that you have for my life where I'm going to be Israel now. Um, and um, it says, and Jacob called the place um, where God spoke to him um, um, Bethel. It says, okay, so then he messes up again. <laughs> it says, then they, they journeyed from Bethel um, um, so why did he leave Bethel? It said, then they journeyed from Bethel, and when they were, um, then went, and there um, was but a little distance to go um, in Ephrath. Um, late, Rachel um, lay, labored in childbirth, and she had hard labor. Um, now it came to pass when she was in hard labor that the midwife said to her, um, Do not fear, you will, your son, um, you will have a son also. And so basically, Rachel died. And so the whole thing is, why did Jacob leave Bethel? God told him, go to Bethel, stay there, dwell there, make your home there. And then he decides to leave when his wife is um, pregnant and um, in advanced in pregnancy. Um, and he, she ends up dying in, in childbirth. And so, you know, he was saying, why did he leave when the Lord told him to stay? Um, and that's a mistake for him. That if the Lord tells us, I want you to dwell and stay in my presence in the house of God, don't leave. Dwell there. Worship me there. Um, and so when we make a choice to then leave God's presence and we go out on our own, catastrophe may follow because the Lord told us to stay. Stay in my presence. And you know, we, we make the choice to then leave. He did that. And look what happened. His wife died. And so we have to be very careful. If the Lord's told us, I want you to stay over here. I want you to dwell in my presence. And then we decide to, to leave. I always tell my kids, um, Jesus said, abide in me and if, um, if you abide in me and my word abide in you, then what you ask of me, I will do for you. Um, so if we choose to abide in Jesus, then we stick really close. That sneaky snake can't get us. But if we stay far from Jesus, that sneaky snake can sneak in and mess, mess us up. And so this is what happens to, J uh, to Jacob. Um, the Lord told him to stick close to me and he, he separated. He went in a different way. And so anyway, she ends up dying and he's mourning. Uh, it says... Um, so Rachel died and was buried on the way to Ephrath, um, that is in Bethlehem. And Jacob set a pillar on her grave, which is the pillar of Rachel's grave, is there to this day. Um, then Israel journeyed and pitched his tent beyond the tower of Edgar. And it happened that when Israel dwelt in the land, that Reuben okay, went and lay with um, Be um, Be Bila, his father's concubine, and Israel heard about it. Okay, so one of the things the pastor was saying is, look at the, what happened. Okay, so he said that Jacob buried Rachel. Okay, but then Israel journeyed on. So the old man, he finally gets it. Like, man, I messed up again. God told me to stay. I left. Now I've lost the wife who I love. So Jacob buried her. But Israel moved on. So he then finally says, that's it. <laughs> uh, Jacob's got to bury this mistake in this old past I Israel and moving on so it's interesting how the Lord distinguishes between the wording it's not in the um, New Living Translation it's in the New King, King James it's a distinction between him being called um, Jacob and then switching his name to him, his now, now Israel so God switches that Israel buried his mistake but Israel I mean but Jacob buried his mistake but Israel governed by God moved on um, and then his son, his oldest son, ends up sleeping with his concubine, but this concubine was Rachel's nurse. So it was a deep betrayal that the oldest son did to his dad, um, and this son came from Leah. So there might have been some rivalry there between Leah and Rachel, remember? So Leah's oldest son, which probably saw the heartbreak of the mom, the mom crying and the mom being always in competition with her sister. So there may have been that where he did it on purpose because it was a deep betrayal against the dad. The oldest son sleeps with the maid, handmaid of um, Rachel um, right after she dies. So the dad's mourning the loss of Rachel. Her Rachel's maid 
probably would have been a great comfort to him after losing his wife. Um, and then the oldest son goes and sleeps with that maid. So it removes the comfort the dad could have gotten in the mourning process. Um, and so it was a deep betrayal that the, the oldest son did to him, um, Reuben. And so what happens is um, Reuben then loses, we'll learn about it later in the, in the scripture, um, but Jacob doesn't do anything at that moment because it says, and Israel heard about it. So one of the things the pastor said is, God didn't say Jacob heard about what his son did because Jacob would have responded not well. Jacob would have responded in the flesh. Um, Jacob would have responded in getting his son back. But Israel responded, and Israel is governed by God. Israel is a changed man. Israel has left his um, the dead man um, in the old flesh buried um, and crucified. Um, and so Israel's response is tempered. And so later it comes to find out um, that Reuben ends up losing the privilege of the firstborn. Um, because it was a betrayal against God, too, um, of what he did to his dad. Um, we're not supposed to betray our parents. And so um, Reuben ends up not be, being considered um, one of the firstborn um, heir, the, the rights of that. Um, and so we're going to end up finding out later what happens to um, Reuben. Um, he get, it says, among Joseph, um, Joseph's brothers, Reuben was firstborn he, and presumed heir by his father, but he forfeited the right because he laid with his father's con concubine. And the birthright then passed in part to Joseph. Um, and so Joseph ends up getting the first right privileges because he's the firstborn of his other wife, Rachel. Reuben was the firstborn of Leah. And so Reuben should have gotten the first by, first right, uh, firstborn rights, but it, because he forfeited it, it ends up going to Joseph. Um, so anyways... Um, that ends it there, and then um, um, he goes back, he's finally with his dad, and Isaac um, breathes his last and dies. Um, but chapter 36 is just, I'm not going to um, go over that um, too much, because it's all of Esau's um, descendants. And it, they, basically, I'm just going to read you what my commentary says. It says, the Edomites, Esau's descendants, are, men, um, are mentioned in the Bible more than 200 times. And the division between them and the descendants of Jacob never went away. During the Exodus, God told Israel to leave the Edomites alone because they were brothers. But Edom refused to let the Israelites enter the land. Later, they became bitter en um, enemies of King David. The book of um, Obadiah is a pronouncement of God's judgment on Edom for its oppression and cruelty towards the Israelites. How sad that the people of um, Esau became an enemy to the heritage of Jacob, the people of Israel. So go through, the, and the Lord kind of explains in 36 all of Esau's descendants. But Esau, even though him and Jacob reconciled, his descendants were forever enemies of the people of Israel, um, which were the descendants of Jacob. So it's this um, never-ending battle. They became the Edomites, and they became the enemies of Israel. So that's it. So Lord Jesus, we just thank you and praise you for your word. We thank you, Lord Jesus, that we got some um, nuggets from you this morning. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for your grace um, and that you um, change us and give us a new nature, Lord Jesus, that the old man, our old nature has been crucified. We pray that we would leave our junk today at the cross. Whatever it is our, that whatever it is that's our idols in our life and our junk in our life, we leave it at the foot of the cross, Lord Jesus, and that we ask that we would crucify our old nature at the cross. Lord Jesus, that we would be transformed um, and into your, made more and more into your image. We ask, Lord Jesus, that you would fill us with your Holy Spirit today and be with us. Put a um, protection over our children, over our uh, husbands, over our households, um, over our president, over Israel, over California, Lord Jesus. We just ask that you would um, continue to protect us under Psalm 91. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, love you guys. Bye.